Hello, everybody. This is Cora Sarah Mack, now past president of the Illinois Mental Health Counselors Association. And today I'm joined by our very own special guest that's coming back for round two, past president herself, Jennifer Frommel. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good also. Thanks for asking. Survived the heat wave, so that's good. Yeah, that's great. And now looking forward to this fall weather we're about to get into. Yes, for sure. All right, so for those of you that don't know, this is my second time interviewing Jennifer. So we are going to be focusing on a specific topic to pick her brain on. And one of the big things that she is known and famous for is her private practice, because she is one of the very few truly successful people to do it. So we're happy to pick your brain about it. Wow, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, right, fingers crossed, we'll all walk away billionaires after this. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so the first question we have here is, what led you to name your private practice Innovative Counseling Partners? Well, to be honest with you, I was contemplating, you know, my model about what what is it that I want to see in the way of, um, you know, partnering with other counselors uh, at the private practice level. And I really didn't want to um, be a, a model that doesn't collaborate and, um, you know, doesn't consider the the clinicians that are going to work at ICP um, as anything but somebody who I would see as a partner, um, even though they're not necessarily signing up as, you know, a responsible fiduciary thing. Um, I wanted them to feel like this isn't like, you know, Jennifer says, and that's all that it is. Um, so that was the, the partners component. I wanted our name to be something that would allow people to realize that we deal with counseling. Um, and then the innovative piece was that when I looked at all the ways in which over the course of the years, I have provided interventions with people um, and that I have trained clinicians on, they've all been very innovative. And so I thought, all right, well, we'll be innovative counseling partners then. Um, because it speaks to, for the clinicians that join us, uh, it speaks to the fact that I see you as a partner. And for the clients, it's identified that we do things in innovative counseling kind of ways. All right, perfect. You know, that's a lot better than what I did for my private practice name. And I just picked mine because it sounded cool, Max and Power. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was kind of lazy on that one, but... Now I got to make up a new story to make it sound just as cool as you know. <laughs> there you go. All right. So speaking of your model and how you run things and things like that. Now, when we dive into it, one really big piece that a lot of people struggle with is where am I going to locate my private practice, right? What city? Yeah. So what city did you start your private practice in and how did you decide on that city? Well, I had actually started my practice initially in Lakeview um, back in the day. Um, and so I, I had already had that awareness of, of the community of Lakeview in the city. Um, and then when I relocated out into the suburbs, um, I was in Oak Park and providing a great deal of services as well to the surrounding communities of Cicero, Illinois. Um, and so when I went to open the group practice, since I had already had so many connections in Oak Park, I decided to make that my hub. Um, so that still remains our largest location. Um, and then from there, what I had done is over the course of years, had also developed relationships, again, in an innovative way with uh, other partner types. So again, going off of the title partner, uh, I actually had partnered with a pediatric occupational therapist and her group is in North Riverside and she really wanted clinicians to work out of her site. So we co-located in the site that she was in and then in, uh, in another relationship that I had with a what would you call her, a functional medicine doctor 
uh, who's a DO practitioner in Hinsdale, she too had said, hey, I really would like someone who is a counselor in my offices. And so I went to her office. And so we started with those three locations due to the fact that I had already had a lot of connections in those communities. And these two providers needed somebody in-house. Uh, so that's how we started. And then in both cases, with the pediatric occupational therapist practice and the DO's practice, we quickly outgrew the space that they had made for us. And so we maintained our space in those buildings. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's intense, but yeah. it looks like you found a way to make it work. So you use it like your connections and then you just branched out. Yes. All right. Perfect. Very nice. I'm learning a lot. All right. So the next piece about your model then, you know, a lot of people have questions about this. Where do I start my rates? Because some people say, well, I should do it low. So that way people will come in. But then other people yeah. are like, no, don't do that, especially if you're taking insurance because they're only going to pay a portion of that. And then something like, well, I don't want to do it too high because people won't come in. But then other people are like, well, the reason why people come in is because of my high rates. So how did you decide on your rates? Um, I decided my rates based on what the insurances were paying. Um, and and really, we're, we're very heavily insurance-based. I really strongly believe that everyone deserves access to good, good clinicians. And um, that's one of the pieces about my model is that I want people to be able to accept, access us. And so I looked at what the, reinsur the insurance reimbursement rates were and made determinations from there in terms of any kind of a sliding fee scale. Um, and that's, that's how I developed my, my sliding fee scale. So um, we have kind of like the high end, the middle, and then the lowest end of what we'll take in terms of uh, private pay. But the vast majority of our clients, I would say 95% are insured. All right. Very nice. Well, that yeah. perfectly answers the second question of, do you do a sliding fee scale and how do you decide on that rate? So you basically decided on insurance then. So you see what yeah. insurance is paying, then you're like, okay, if they don't make this amount or if they don't do that amount, then it goes down. Or how do you decide that? Yeah, it's really dependent upon. So like if we have a client who starts and let's just say they have Aetna insurance, mm -hmm. we know what Aetna will allow us to bill for. And then if the client loses their coverage, then we take it from there and we alter it to a self-pay rate until they get insured again. And again, if if that self-pay rate becomes too much while maybe they're unemployed, then we can lower all the way down um, inclusive of to a pro bono rate since we have uh, second year interns that may in fact be able to support those clients in times when they don't have any you know, financial um, well-being at that time. Oh, wow. Very nice. Now I got to start thinking of my sliding scale rates now. All right, perfect. All right, so speaking of clients, you know, this is a huge question that a lot of people have, right, in regards to clients, because they believe starting out, I got to take any client that I can get so that way I can build out my caseload. And some people are like, well, no, I'm going to start, you know, really taking a look to see what clientele I really want to work with and just start only taking those clientele. So what clients did you accept when you started out working and what clients do you prefer, or sorry, prefer, what clients do you refer out and how did you come to that decision? So we're pretty much a generalist practice um, in the sense that we take ages six and up. Um, and so myself, again, looking at it from the perspective of the clients that I had experience with when I started the practice, uh, I had had experience from ages six and up, and many of the clinicians that I vet and bring in also do. And if they don't, they get kind of on the job training. If they do, in fact, get assigned somebody, um, we might allow them only to have two or three of those cases while they get accustomed to working with those case types. But that is one of the other pieces to the practice model is that 
I believe very much in supporting the growth and development of clinicians. I also believe very strongly that clinicians who only stay with one client type burn out quickly because I've seen it happen over and over again over the course of my gosh, however many years it's been now, since 1996, and I've been supervising since 1999, so 24 years of supervising people who only see one case type, it does not look pretty at the end of a lifetime of seeing clients. So I really want to have clinicians who are more well-rounded so that they are more functional and they aren't limited in their capacities. All right, definitely. I guess that does make sense, right? See one client or one specific type of client all the time just becomes super mundane. It's just like, oh, yeah. 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 All right. Perfect. So then I know you were talking a little bit about, you know, outgrowing one of the places that you were at. So with that being said, how did you know it was time to expand your private practice? When the referrals that kept coming were to a degree where it literally was like another caseload. Um, I don't believe in waiting lists. I have worked in community mental health long enough to know that wait lists really don't work. Um, and, and so as a result, what I decided to start doing was um, taking on clinicians that could take over these referrals and would want to partner and uh, grow themselves as well as, you know, partner with me um, to ensure that the type of service intervention that uh, we were providing, there, there was some consistency in the way I like to see things done uh, from a clinical perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do, in fact, have a uh, an integrative mental health assessment uh, when we're looking at all clients. So all clients get the same level of assessment, whether they're an adult, a couple, or a child. And um, everybody follows the same model in that regard. But from there, all the services can vary, right? Depending on how the individual or the, the family is in need. Okay, all right, definitely. So speaking of that, I know I didn't put this on the original question. So in regards to, you know, you hiring clinicians, is it more of a, they come in and they're like your employees, or is it more of they come in, they pay you a certain amount of money and they keep the rest? Or what would you say your model is for that if you're willing to share? Yeah, our model is definitely more of a W-2 employee relationship. Um, over the course of time, I have some clinicians who want to continue doing other things in their professional lives, such as being real estate people or uh, want to continue working into community mental health or want to work in a hospital setting full time, but they really want to keep their clinical skills um, strong in terms of keeping ongoing therapeutic intervention um, in their wheelhouse, because many of those positions Obviously, real estate is one that you don't get to really use too much of your clinical wherewithal, though you do, because, you know, you're helping people at a very stressful time of their life make a big decision. Um, but I, I have really offered up that opportunity for those that are fully licensed to choose to be a 1099 versus a W-2. Okay. Yeah. Would you say that works for you then? Would do most people take that? Or would you say it's more of a prefer the safety and security of a W-2? Yeah, I would say that right now we are definitely more in a W-2 place heavy than we are of an independent contractor heavy. Okay. Well, yeah. that definitely does speak volumes to your success because you your practice is at multiple locations, right? So yeah. how did you determine those other locations then to branch out to? A lot of it was organic. Um, when it came to referrals, having clients just kind of reaching out from different communities just started happening. And the more that we started getting those referrals, especially during COVID, we started noticing, you know, that the, those communities maybe didn't have as much access, especially for insurance. Um, so for example, Crystal Lake was one of the cases where we had had a couple of providers that were living out that way. Uh, that worked for us and we're driving into Oak Park or North Riverside 
And they found themselves just saying, you know, I keep getting, because people in that community know me and they know I'm a clinician. And so they were like, hey, so what I would do in cases like that is I would find a location that would be central to that area. And then I would look for a space where we could sublease um, or take on a single year lease and just see what would happen um, just to kind of trial and error it. You've got to be comfortable uh, with the fact that sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but again, recognizing that if in fact it is a community that is underserved or doesn't have a lot of providers in it that um, offer up services in the model you're using or like the insurance reimbursement piece, um, you know, if you build it, they might come. So Crystal Lake was one of those cases. Uh, Libertyville became another location as well that happened much similarly. Um, and then more recently, our South Loop location uh, became something that happened due to the fact that during COVID, we started taking on quite a few clients that are more South Side based. And so we wanted to be able to provide access as things were opening up uh, to those clients so that way they didn't have to drive for in-person work to one of our other locations that would be further away. All right, definitely. So I know you mentioned that we, whenever you're taking on like a new building or a new location, you have to be okay with the possibility of failing, right? Yes. And with this next question, I know a lot of people are like, mm, poor Sarah, I don't know, right? Because when we're talking about picking a building, Right. You know, just like what you mentioned, sometimes we have to do some trial and error, sometimes some one year lease, yeah. hoping that it'll pick up. Or if not, we might be losing out on a lot of money. So with speaking to that, how do you determine the buildings you move into? Honestly, I like to take a look for buildings that offer up easy parking for both clients and the clinicians. I also look at like the aesthetics surrounding the location. You know, is it someplace that again, for our clinicians, it's easy to pop out and grab some food, easy to pop out, grab some coffee. Um, is it an area where you can maybe go for a walk with a client? Again, going by that innovative piece. Um, is it something that um, the building has amenities in it? So for example, our South Loop location, the piece that I looked at there was its proximity to major highways. So clients didn't have to drive, um, you know, three miles, but take 30 minutes to drive those three miles because of the city traffic. Um, and then also making sure that because of that location, um, having its close proximity to, you know, some areas that might have had over the course of the COVID years, um, some uh, unsavory types of things happening um, that we had locked doors and we had, you know, somebody at the front door of that building. So that way when my clinicians come in and our clients come in, they feel safe. Um, and then also like, you know, does the building offer up anything special? Like, uh, do they offer up free water service or free Wi-Fi or, um, you know, free air conditioning um, or uh, vending machines, you know, those little things can make a difference. And I think both for the client as well as the clinician. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I'm learning a lot now if I ever want to expand. Right. So you're giving me a lot of things to think about. Yeah. All right. So in regards to your private practice, I know the first time we did our interview, you mentioned a few things that you were working on. So let's follow up with some of those to see any updates or any progress that you've made on it. All right, so first up, I know you mentioned, I'm gonna go out of order here. So first your equine therapy with your horse named London, how was that going? So that took a little bit of a break. Um, I had found myself being so ensconced in some of our billing issues and, um, and so forth that I really didn't have ample time to get out and cost share my time with London. Um, the cost share expectation is twice a week. And um, I really was only getting out there once a week. So uh, the, the, the woman who owns London said, you know, just come when you can, you know, and get it in when you can get it in. But I'm not going to keep taking your money if you can't make it twice a week. Um, 
But what I will also say is the other thing that became a, a deterrent was I had been for quite a long time, um, since uh, about six years ago, um, had been wanting to uh, hike to Mount Everest. And so in, in December, I booked my my trip and um, began practicing and preparing myself for the physical rigors of getting to Everest. Um, and so rather than spending time at the stables, I found myself hiking a lot um, and doing a lot more working out. So I had to figure out time to fit that in. And um, so it did that um, for pretty much the most part of April. All right. Very nice. Mount Everest. Yeah. That's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, no. Are you going to try to go all the way up to the top or? No, I don't, I don't want to No. While I was um, on my journey, um, one of the villages that I stayed in, um, the, the, the owners of the tea house, uh, one evening while we were sitting around the, you know, the, the heat source and the building, um, got really quiet. And I asked my guide what, it, what happened because I noticed the change in their tone and everything. Mm -hmm. he said uh and I said no tell me and he said um three Sherpa from the village that we walked through that day mm -hmm. had died at the Kungu Icefall which is the very first thing you have to climb in order to get onto Everest and um yeah I I, I saw for myself I'm good <laughs> I'm, I don't I don't need to cross the Kungu Icefall right yeah. Wow, that's intense. Well, I'm glad you didn't do it, right? <laughs> right. Well, who knows? This might be a new type of therapy, Everest therapy. <laughs> right. <laughs> I did use mindfulness meditative walking majority of my time. Yeah. Yeah. See, there you go. Yeah. Right. When one door closes, another door opens. Right. <laughs> All right. So then going off of that aspect, I know one of the things that you mentioned you're trying to do more with your clients is more outdoors outdoorsy type of therapy or ecotherapy yeah. has that made any progress yeah so I continued to do that um I I moved my locations I used to see clients in Oak Park twice a week and in Hinsdale once a week and um what I did during this past year is spend more time in Hinsdale whereby I'm closer to a stream and some hiking paths um, so have been taking clients there uh, to do different things with like regards to meditation and mindfulness and so forth. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Got to do it now before it gets cold outside. Oh, no, I do it even when it's cold. Oh, really? Yeah, we just bundle up. Yeah, that's fair. I guess you could do that too. Right. Got to get the experience all year yeah. round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So then another thing that you mentioned during our first interview was supervising and training new clinicians just to make sure that they have that whole well-rounded experience. How is that going? It's great. Um, you know, I think, again, for those who aren't faint of heart, um, you know, taking on an intern itself is a lot. Um, we've continued to take on 10 at a time. And um, this past year, um, we ended up all 10 graduated and seven of them stayed on board with us. Uh, so that's the first time that we've had that many stay with us after graduation. Um, and uh, we're last week onboarded our next 10. So we're back at it. All right. Very nice. Do you, they bundle up with you and go out to do <laughs> the therapy? You know, I haven't had them. No, I haven't. Okay. Who knows? Maybe in this next batch, you might find one that's very yeah. know about it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. So now we get to that time of the interview again, where we're down to our final three questions. Oh, no. I know. All good things must come to an end. Right. All right. So the first out of the final three. So what advice would you give someone that is looking to start their own private practice or is looking to improve their private practice? Um, I think for those that are considering it, you know, you really might want to talk to somebody who's who's in it um, just to really understand the wherewithal and all the things that are important, such as billing. Um, I know a couple of the clinicians that had been with me for a while decided to break out on their own this past year. 
Um, and I, I got some pretty tearful people calling me um, saying that I had no idea and oh my gosh, and how do you not have a whole head of gray hair? Um, because it is, it's really overwhelming. Insurance makes it that way. If you want to take insurance clients, mm -hmm. um, people that I know who went to private pay only models found themselves feeling very hungry. Um, so it, it really, I think would behoove you to talk to somebody real time, uh, about that experience. Um, I think if you're even looking at expanding, right, from being a single practitioner to having an intern or taking on um, another person, you know, making sure that you're doing it the right way. Um, I know plenty of practices out there that are bringing on people um, and not making them W-2s or are making them W-2s and kind of doing what I say, selling them a bridge in China that doesn't exist. And it, they, they don't realize it doesn't exist until they're in it. Um, so I, I want to make sure that, you know, those folks that are looking to expand or think about doing something, I think it's fabulous to, you know, not keep yourself, you know, stuck, you know, um, but I also think it's really, really important that you're realistic about what you're getting yourself into. All right, definitely. Great words of wisdom right there, if I ever heard them. All right, perfect. All right, so second to last question. Is there anything that you want to say that I haven't had a chance to ask you about this time around? Um, no, I, I will say that one of the things I have been doing lately is I have been doing more um, kind of coaching uh, clinicians who are looking at private practice uh, or, or helping folks that have already developed a private practice kind of look at their model uh, look at their approaches and, you know, just give them a little bit more guidance and direction. Um, so I'm definitely open to doing more of that. And I know other colleagues of mine that are also open to doing that. I know, um, you know, a few different people that would be good, um, you know, for, for clinicians to get the support from, right? Just like a, you get a counseling session for yourself for counseling. Maybe you might need a, you know, a, a counseling coach, um, to help you in your own, you know, development with your business model. All right, perfect. All right, so then this perfectly segues into the last question then. So where can people contact you if they have any questions or are looking to get more information? Yeah, they can contact me um, either through my email address, which I believe is up on ICA under the Insurance Task Force. Um, or you can go to icpcares.com or innovativecounselingpartners.com and go to the contact us page and just let me know, let us know uh, what it is you're looking for, and I will be in contact with you. All right, perfect. All right, well, everybody, that's it for this interview. Again, Jennifer, thank you for doing this part two. We're going to have to have you back for a part three. Now I just have more questions. <laughs> well, thank you. I would be more than welcome and more than happy to come back. All right. Perfect. All right, everybody. That's it for me. This is Corsair Max, now past president of the Illinois Mental Health Council Association, signing out. And I will see you all in the next interview. Take care. <laughs>